going to continue on reading uh, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring with uh, chapter four, Surface Waters and Underground Seas. Of all our natural resources, water has become the most precious. By far, the greater part of the Earth's surface is covered by its enveloping seas. Yet, in the midst of this plenty, we are in want. By a strange paradox, most of the Earth's abundant water is not usable for agriculture, industry, or human consumption because of its heavy load of sea salts. And so most of the world's population is either experiencing or is threatened with critical shortages. In an age when man has forgotten his origins and is blind even to his most essential needs for survival, water, along with other resources, has become the victim of his indifference. The problem of water pollution by pesticides can be understood only in context. As part of the whole to which it belongs, the pollution of the total environment of mankind. The pollution entering our waterways come from many sources. Radioactive waste from reactors, laboratories, and hospitals. Fallout from nuclear explosions. Domestic waste from cities and towns chemical waste from factories. To these is added a new kind of fallout, the chemical sprays applied to croplands and gardens, forests and fields. Many of the chemical agents in this alarming melange imitate and augment the harmful effects of radiation. And within the groups of chemicals themselves, there are sinister and little understood interactions, transformations, and summations of effect. Ever since chemists began to manufacture substances that nature never invented. The problems of water purification have become complex and the danger to users of water has increased. As we have seen, the production of these synthetic chemicals in large volume began in the 1940s. It has now reached such proportions that an appalling deluge of chemical pollution is daily poured into the nation's waterways. When inextricably mixed with domestic and other waste discharges, into the same water. These chemicals sometimes defy detection by the methods of ordinary use by purification plants. Most of them are so stable that they cannot be broken down by ordinary processes. Often they cannot be identified in rivers, a really incredible variety of pollutants combine to produce deposits that the sanitary engineers can only 
disparagingly referred to as gunk. Professor Rolf Eliasson of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology testified before a congressional committee to the impossibility of predicting the composite effect of these chemicals or of identifying the organic matter resulting from the mixture. We don't begin to know what that is, said Professor Eliasson. What is the effect on the people? We don't know. To an ever increasing degree, chemicals used for the control of insects, rodents, or unwanted vegetation contribute to these organic pollutants. Some are deliberately applied to bodies of water to destroy plants, insect larvae, or desire undesired fishes. Some come from forest spring that may blanket two or three million acres of a single state with spray directed against a single insect pest. Spray that falls directly into streams or that drips down through the leafy canopy to the forest floor there to become part of the slow movement of seeping moisture, beginning its long journey to the sea. Probably the bulk of such contaminants are the waterborne residues of the millions of pounds of agricultural chemicals that have been applied to farmlands for insects or rodent control and have been leached out of the ground by rains to become part of the universal seaward movement of water. Here and there, we have dramatic evidence of the presence of these chemicals in our streams and even in public water supplies. For example, a sample of drinking water from an orchard area in Pennsylvania, when tested in, on fish in a laboratory, contained enough insecticide to kill all of the test fish in only four hours. Water from a stream draining sprayed cotton fields remained lethal to fishes even after it had passed through a purifying plant. And in 15 streams tributary to the Tennessee River in Alabama, the runoff from fields treated with toxaphene, a chlorinated hydrocarbon, killed all the fish inhabiting the streams. Two of these streams were sources of municipal water supply. Yet for a week after the application of the insecticide, the water remained poisonous, a fact attested by the daily deaths of goldfish suspended in cages downstream. For the most part, this pollution is unseen and invisible, making its presence known when hundreds or thousands of fish die, but more often never detected at all. The chemist who guard water purity has no routine test for these organic pollutants and no way to remove them. 
but whether detected or not, the pesticides are there. And as might be expected with any material applied to land surfaces on so vast a scale, they have now found their way into many and perhaps all of the major river systems of the country. If anyone doubts that our water has become almost universally contaminated with insecticides, he should study a small report issued by the United States Fish and Wildlife Service in 1960. The service had carried out studies to discover whether fish like warm blooded animals store insecticides in their tissues. The first samples were taken from forest areas in the west where there have been mass sprayings of DDT for the control of spruce bud worm. As might have been expected, all of these fish contain DDT. The really significant findings were made when the investigators turned for comparison to a creek in a remote area about 30 miles from the nearest spring for bud worm control. This creek was upstream from the first and separated from it by a high waterfall. No local spraying was known to have occurred. Yet these fish too contain DDT. Had the chemical reached this remote creek by hidden underground streams? Or has it been airborne, drifting down as fallout in the surface of the creek? And still another comparative study, DDT was found in the tissues of fish from a hatchery where the water supply originated from a deep well. Again, there was no record of local spraying. The only possible means of contamination seemed to be by means of groundwater. In the entire water pollution problem, there is probably nothing more disturbing than the threat of widespread contamination of groundwater. It is not possible to add pesticides to water anywhere without threatening the purity of water everywhere. Seldom, if ever, does nature operate in close and separate compartments, and she has not done so in distributing the earth's water supply. Rain falling on the land settles down through pores and cracks in soil and rock, penetrating deeper and deeper until eventually it reaches a zone where all the pores of the rock are filled with water. A dark subsurface sea rising under hills, sinking beneath valleys. This groundwater is always on the move, sometimes at a pace so slow that it travels no more than 50 feet a year, sometimes rapidly by comparison so that it moves nearly a tenth of a mile in a day. It travels by unseen waterways 
until here and there it comes to the surface as a spring or perhaps it is trapped to feed a well. But mostly it contributes to the streams and so to rivers. Except for what enters streams directly as rain or surface runoff, all the running water of the Earth's surface was at one time groundwater. And so, in a very real and frightening sense, pollution of the groundwater, it's pollution of water everywhere. It must have been by such a dark underground sea that poisonous chemicals traveled from a manufacturing plant in Colorado to a farming district several miles away. There the poison wells sicken humans and livestock and damage crops. An extraordinary episode that may easily be only the first of many like it. Its history in brief is this. In 1943, the Rocky Mountain Arsenal of the Army Chemical Corps located near Denver, began to manufacture war materials. Eight years later, the facilities of the arsenal were leased to a private oil company for the production of insecticides. Even before the change of operations, however, mysterious reports had begun to come in. Farmers several miles from the plant began to report unexplained sickness among livestock. They complained of extensive crop damage, foliage turned yellow, plants failed to mature, and many crops were killed outright. There were reports of human illness, thought by some to be related. The irrigation waters on these farms were derived from shallow wells. When the well water were examined, in a study in 1959, in which several states and federal agencies participated, they were found to contain an assortment of chemicals, chlorides, chlorates, salts of phosphonic acid, fluorides, and arsenic have been discharged from the Rocky Mountain Arsenal into holding ponds during the years of its operation. Apparently, the groundwater between the arsenal and the farms had become contaminated and had taken seven to eight years for the waste to travel underground a distance of about three miles from the holding ponds to the nearest farm. This seepage had continued to spread and had further contaminated an area of unknown extent. The investigators knew of no way to contain the contamination or to halt its advance. All of this was bad enough, but the most mysterious 
and probably in the long run, the most significant feature of the whole episode was the discovery of the weed killer 24D. And some of the wells and the holding ponds of the arsenal. Certainly, its presence was enough to account for the damage to crops irrigated with this water. But the mystery lay in the fact that no 24D had been manufactured at the arsenal at any stage of its operations. Long and careful study After a long and careful study, the chemists at the plant concluded that the 2,4-D had been formed spontaneously in the open basins. Had it, it had been formed there from other substances, discharged from the arsenal. In the presence of air, water, and sunlight, and without, and quite without the intervention of human chemists, the holding ponds had become chemical laboratories for the production of a new chemical, a chemical fatally damaging to much of the plant life it touched. And so, the story of the Colorado farms and their damaged crops assumes a significance that transcends its local importance. What other parallels may there be? Not only in Colorado, but wherever chemical pollution finds its way into public waters. In lakes and streams everywhere, in the presence of catalyzing air and sunlight, what dangerous substances may be born of the parent chemicals labeled harmless? Indeed, one of the most alarming aspects of the chemical pollution of water is the fact that here, in river or lake or reservoir, or for that matter, in the glass of water served at your dinner table, are mingled chemicals that no responsible chemist would think of combining in his laboratory. The possible interactions between these freely mixed chemicals are deeply disturbing to officials of the United States Public Health Service who have expressed the fear that the production of harmful substances from comparatively innocuous, innocuous chemicals may be taking place on quite a wide scale. The reactions may be between two or more chemicals or between chemicals and the radioactive waste that are being discharged into our rivers in ever increasing volume. Under the impact of ionizing radiation, some rearrangement of atoms could easily occur, changing the nature of the chemicals in a way that is not only unpredictable, but beyond 
control. This is, of course, not only the groundwaters that are becoming contaminated, but surface moving waters as well. Streams, rivers, irrigation waters. A disturbing example of the latter seems to be building up on the National Wildlife Refuges at Tule Lake and Lower Klamath, both in California. These refuges are part of a chain, including also the refuge on Upper Klamath Lake, just over the border in Oregon. All are linked, perhaps fatefully, by a shared water supply, and all are affected by the fact that they lie like small islands in a great sea of surrounding farmlands. Land reclaimed by drainage and stream diversion from an original waterfowl paradise of marshland and open water. These farmlands around the refuges are now irrigated by water from Upper Klamath Lake. The irrigation waters recollected from the fields that they serve are then pumped into Thule Lake and from there to the lower Klamath. All of the waters of the wildlife refuges established on these two bodies of water therefore represent the drainage of agricultural lands. It is important to remember that this in connection with with recent happenings. In the summer of 1960, the refuge staff picked up hundreds of dead and dying birds at Thule Lake and Lower Klamath. Most of them were fish-eating species herons, pelicans, grebs, and gulls. Upon analysis, they were found to contain insecticide residues identified as toxaphene, DDD, and DDE. Fish from the lakes were also found to contain insecticides. So did samples of plankton. The refuge manager believes that pesticide residues are now building up in the waters of these refuges, being conveyed there by return irrigation flow from heavily sprayed agricultural lands. Such poisoning of waters set aside for conservation purposes could have consequences felt by every western duck hunter and anyone to whom the sight and sound of drifting ribbons of waterfowl across an evening sky are precious. These particular refuges occupy critical positions in the conservation of western waterfowl. They lie at a point corresponding to the narrow neck of a funnel into which all the migratory paths 
composing what is known as the Pacific Flyway, Converge. During the fall migration, they received many millions of ducks and geese from nesting grounds extended from the shores of the Bering Sea east to Hudson Bay. Fully three-fourths of all the waterfowl that move south into the Pacific coast states in autumn. In summer, they provide nesting areas for waterfowl, especially for two endangered species, the redhead and ruddy duck. If the lakes and pools of these refuges become seriously contaminated, the damage to the waterfowl populations of the far west could be irreparable. Water must also be thought of in terms of the chains of life it supports. From the small as dust green cells of drifting plant plankton through the minute water flees to the fishes that strain plankton from the water and are in turn eaten by other fishes or by birds, mink, raccoons, in an endless cycle transfer of materials from life to life. We know that the necessary minerals in the waters are so passed from link to link of the food chains. We can suppose that poisons we introduce into water will not also enter into these cycles of nature. Can we suppose that poisons we introduce into water will not enter into these cycles of nature? The answer is to be found in the amazing history of Clear Lake, California. Clear Lake lies in mountainous country some 90 miles north of San Francisco. It has been long been popular with angulars. The name is inappropriate for actually it is rather turbid lake because of the soft black ooze that covers its shallow bottom. Unfortunately for the fishermen and the resort dwellers on its shore, its waters have provided an ideal habitat for a small gnat, Cheoborus astictopus. Although closely related to mosquitoes, the gnat is not a bloodsucker and probably does not feed at all as an adult. However, human beings who snared its, who shared its habitat found it annoying because of its sheer numbers. Efforts were made to control it, but they were largely fruitless until in the late 1940s. The chlorinated hydrocarbon insecticide offered new weapons. The chemical chosen for a fresh attack was DDD, a close relative of DDT but apparently offering fewer threats to fish 
life. The new control measures undertaken in 1949 were carefully planned and few people would have supposed any harm could result. The lake was surveyed, its volume determined, and the insecticide applied in such great dilution that for every part of chemical there would be 70 million parts of water. Control of the gnats was at first good, but by 1954, the treatment had to be repeated, this time at the rate of one part of insecticide to 50 million parts of water. The destruction of the gnats was thought to be virtually complete. The following winter, mumps, brought the first imitation that other life was affected. The western grebs on the lake began to die, and soon more than a hundred of them were reported dead. At Clear Lake, the western greb is a breeding bird and is also a winter visitant. Attracted by the abundant fish of the lake, it is a bird of spectacular appearance with beguiling habits, building its floating nests in shallow lakes of Western United States and Canada. It is called the swan greb with reason, for it glides with scarcely a ripple across the lake's surface, the body riding low, white neck and shining black head held high. The newly hatched chick is clothed in soft gray down. In only a few hours, it takes to the water and rides on the back of its father or mother, nestled under the parental wing coverts. Following a third assault, on the ever resilient gnat population. In 1957, more grebs died. It has, as had been true in 1954, no evidence of infectious disease could be discovered on examination of the dead birds. But when someone thought to analyze the fatty tissues of the grebs. They were found to be loaded with DDD in the extraordinary concentration of 16,000 parts per million. The maximum concentration applied to the water was 1 in 50 parts per million. How could the chemical have built up to such a prodigious, prodigious level in the grebs? These birds, of course, are fish eaters. When the fish of Clear Lake also were analyzed, the picture began to take form. The poison being picked up by the smallest organisms, concentrated and passed on to the larger predators. Plankton organisms were found to contain about five parts per million of the insecticide, which was about 25 times the maximum concentration which 
ever reached in the water itself. Plant-eating fishes have built up accumulations ranging from 40 to 300 parts per million. Carnivorous species had stored the most of all. One brown bullhead had the astounding concentration of 2,500 parts per million. It was a house that Jack built sequence in which the large carnivores had eaten the smaller carnivores that had eaten the herbivores that had eaten the plankton that had absorbed the poison from the water. Even more extraordinary discoveries were made later. No trace of DDD could be found in the water shortly after the last application of the chemical. But the poison had not really left the lake. It had merely gone into the fabric or the life the lake supports. 23 months after the chemical treatment had ceased, the plankton still contained as much as 5.3 parts per million. In that interval of nearly two years, successive crops of plankton had flowered and faded away, but the poison, although no longer present in the water, had somehow passed from generation to generation, and it lived on in the animal life of the lake as well. All fish, birds, and frogs examined a year after the chemical applications had ceased still contained DDD. The amount found in the flesh always exceeded by many times the original concentration in the water. Among these living carriers were fish that had hatched nine months after the last DDD application. Grebs and California gulls had had built up concentrations of more than of more than 2,000 parts per million. Meanwhile, the nesting colonies of the grebs dwindled from more than 1,000 pairs before the first insecticide treatment to about 30 pairs in 1960. And even the 30 seemed to have nested in vain for no young grebs have been observed on the lake since the last DDD application. This whole chain of poisoning then seems to rest on a base of minute plants which must have been the original concentrators. But what of the opposite end of the food chain? The human being who in probable ignorance of all, its, all of this sequence of events has rigged his fishing tackle, caught a string of fish from the waters of Clear Lake and then taken them home to fry for supper. What would, what could a heavy dose of DDD or perhaps repeated doses do to him? Although the California Department of Public Health professed to see no hazard 
Nevertheless, in 1959, it required that the use of DDD in the lake to be stopped. In view of the scientific evidence of the vast biological potency of this chemical, the action seems a minimum safety measure. The physiological effects of DDD is probably unique among insecticides, for it destroys part of the adrenal gland. The cells of the outer layer as the adrenal cortex, which secretes the hormone cortin. This destructive effect, known since 1948, was at first believed to be confined to dogs because it was not revealed in such experimental animals as monkeys, rats, or rabbits. It seemed suggestive, however, that DDD produced in dogs a condition very similar to that occurring in a man in the presence of Addison's disease. Recent medical research has revealed that DDD does strongly suppress the function of the human adrenal cortex. Its cell-destroying capacity is now clinically utilized in the treatment of a rare type of cancer which develops in the adrenal gland. The clear light situation brings up a question that the public needs to face. Is it wise or desirable to use substances with such strong effect on physiological processes for the control of insects, especially when the control measures involve introducing the chemical directly to a body of water. The fact that the insecticide was applied in very low concentrations is meaningless. It is as is as its explosive progress through the natural food chain in the lake demonstrates. Yet Clear Lake is typical of a large and growing number of situations where a solution of an obvious and often trivial problem creates a far more serious but conveniently less tangible one. Here, the problem was resolved in favor of those annoyed by gnats and at the expense of an unstated and probably not even clearly understood risk to all who took food or water from the lake. It is extraordinary it is an extraordinary fact that the deliberate introduction of poisons into a reservoir is becoming a fairly common practice. The purpose is usually to promote recreational uses, even though the water must then be treated at some expense to make it fit for its intended use as drinking water. When sportsmen of an area want to improve fishing in a reservoir, they prevail on authorities 
to dump quantities of poisons into it to kill the undesired fish, which are then replaced with hatchery fish more suited to the port sportsman's taste. The procedure has a strange Alice in Wonderson Wonderland quality. The reservoir was created as a public water supply. Yet, the community, probably unconsulted about the sportsman project, is forced either to drink water containing poisonous residues or to pay out tax money for treatment of the water to remove the poisons. Treatments are by no means foolproof. As ground and surface waters are contaminated with pesticides and other chemicals, there is danger that not only poisonous, but also cancer-producing substances are being introduced into public water supplies. Dr. W. C. Hoopner of the National Cancer Institute has warned that the danger of cancer hazards for the consumption of contaminated drinking water will grow considerably within the foreseeable future. And indeed, a study made in Holland in the early 1950s provides support for the view that polluted waterways may either carry a cancer hazard. Cities receiving their drinking water from rivers had a higher death rate from cancer than did those whose water came from sources presumably less susceptible to pollution, such as wells. Arsenic, the environmental substance most clearly established as causing cancer in man, is involved in two historic cases in which polluted water supplies cause widespread occurrence of cancer. In one case, the arsenic came from the slag of heaps of mining operations. In the other, from rock from a high natural content of arsenic. These conditions may easily be duplicated as a result of heavy applications of arsenical insecticides. The soil in which such areas become poison, rains, then carry the arsenic into streams, rivers, and reservoirs as well as into the vast subterranean seas of groundwater. Here again, we are reminded that in nature, nothing exists alone. To understand more clearly how the pollution of our world is happening, we must now look at another of the Earth's basic resources, the soil. So that ends chapter four of uh, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. Um, I find some sections in this uh, chapter quite um, I would say that the um, creation of 2,4-D herbicide uh, by settling ponds through, uh, some people use the term natural attenuation, 
but um, during that time, you're looking at 1962 when this book was published. Again, the 40s was when a lot of the chemical warfare activities were occurring. But uh, the 60s brought on a time of war also in Vietnam, Southeast Asia, Cambodia, where uh, this substance 2,4-D was used as a defoliant, as a part of the combat strategies. So I find it interesting that, that um, this substance found some applications in, again, a reuse of a, a war tool. So that was a full chapter reading. And I hope um, that uh, those that are listening kind of had patience to uh, hear it through. But uh, uh, with some of my mispronunciations or stumblings and repeating of sentences, uh, quite a... Uh, a game changer book which a lot of the the current environmental protections in the United States if not the world health organizations um, have taken on a lot of the um, issues related to this book and even to this day, what was discussed by Rachel Carson still has not been resolved. As in the words of the uh, one of the Fords here by Albert Schweitzer, who said, Man has lost the capacity to foresee and to forestall. He will end by destroying the earth. <laughs>